Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our second talk about creativity. We're looking at how creativity relates to digestion. Digestive processes provide the raw materials and energy we need for creative activity. In the case of our human organism, our digestive system harvests raw materials and energies from the foods that we eat. So they're available for us to replace worn out cells, heal wounds, recover from illnesses, and build muscle mass, for instance, when we take up new exercises, and much more. In the case of pregnancy, the digestive system yields raw materials that feed into the development of an entirely new human organism. In a more psychological sense, when we encounter difficulties and limitations, we often feel rather set back. Life can feel quite painful and discouraging. But over time, we digest these experiences and move beyond them, finding creative solutions and new ways of discovering meaning and purpose in our lives. Often, we come out of such experiences feeling stronger in a psychological sense than we were before. We cultivate greater wisdom and compassion and thus can live with more clarity and kindness. I hope you find this talk helpful. Let's begin. We will be focusing in this talk on the mouth the entrance point to our digestive system. But first I want to review some of the key points from the initial talk in this series. I presented the idea of the human form, more or less the shape that we're looking at in this fine sculpture. But I pointed out that a more accurate shape from a certain point of view is that of a tube. We evolved initially as tubular organisms, rather similar to what we today call an earthworm. Our ancestors 500 or more million years ago were morphologically similar to the earthworm of today, having a long narrow body with a digestive system that passed through it from end to end. We have a mouth that takes in food, an anus that expels waste, and a digestive system that harvests energy and raw materials along the way. Now our human digestive system elaborated quite a bit from its early origins. So there's this large pouch we call a stomach and long coils of what we call intestines. There are also accessory organs not shown here, such as the liver and the pancreas. But the basic form of a tube passing from the mouth to the anus remains. And something else remains from our worm-like origins, and that's a form of movement. The digestive tract, the tubes within it, move much like the worm that we're looking at in this video. So sections constrict and lengthen in a sequential way and that establishes a movement pattern that guides food through the system. Now we don't often think about what's going on inside in our intestines, but right now as we sit here, they are moving in a way rather similar to what we see on the screen. And this is an ongoing process that connects the forms of life that we call earthworms to the forms of life we call stomach and intestines. I chose the earthworm as our model partly because I have a history with earthworms, having done research on their nervous system in graduate school, but also because the name itself is very fitting as I move this project called Mindful Biology in the direction of helping us feel more at one with the earth, and to notice that the earth lives within our bodies in important ways. So this is the body of experience that is 
very much in the present moment. It's the tangible sense of having a body, of having feelings of hunger and thirst and pleasure and pain. But not at the level of evaluating them, simply at the level of raw, earthly, substantial experience. So right now, as you sit here, you can feel your sitting bones against the furniture below. Or if you're standing, you can feel your feet upon the floor. If you were lying down, you'd feel your back supported by the surface beneath. These tangible experiences are the stuff of what I'm going to call the earth body, using a term that isn't commonly used so that I can be clear about what I mean. Last time I also discussed how our digestive system breaks down the foodstuffs that we eat into raw materials. So proteins are broken down into amino acids. And those raw materials are then available for the creative process of synthesizing new biomolecules, for instance, new proteins, as we see happening in this little animation. And this synthetic creative process builds up the body. It builds up the digestive tract itself. It builds up the muscle. It builds up the skin. It builds up the entire organism. Now that is another experience of the body, a more conceptual one, to think about all of these molecular processes that have been elucidated by so many people and so many advanced technologies. This experience of the body is very much about our human brain and its capacity to observe, analyze, and tell coherent stories. So this experience of the body is something I'm going to call the brain body. It could, of course, be called the mind. But by using a less familiar term, the brain body, we can avoid confusion about other usages of terms that are more common. Another segment of last session's talk concerned the psychological creativity that I mentioned. The idea that we can have some kind of difficulty occur. For instance, our body could be getting older, or it could suffer an illness or an injury, or it simply could have some kind of scarring or cosmetic change that makes it so it doesn't look the way we wish. And we face this change in our bodily existence, and at first it often feels quite challenging, sometimes overwhelming. But with time, we have this natural ability to digest the experience and creatively move forward. This is captured pretty well by the story of the phoenix. So a situation begins that feels like a lot has been destroyed. There's a pile of ashes where something important once existed. But over time, something new emerges right out of those ashes in a creative process that helps us adapt and move forward. This form of experience has a lot to do with how we relate to life and relate to our bodies. So there's always, in most of our experiences, a sense of either wanting this experience, feeling in a sense like it's a friend, or not wanting it, feeling like it's a foe. There are also a great many experiences that we tend to overlook, which are somewhere in, the, in between. They're more neutral. But this relating quality of assessing in a pre-verbal way, whether this is something that we feel friendly toward or feel opposed to, is what I'm going to call the heart body. And this can take many forms, including the more commonly understood sense of the heart of feeling compassion and caring. But really the heart is weighing in on just about everything that comes our way, giving us a, a sense of its value for us uh, in terms of promoting or impeding our biological survival and thriving. So we have these three bodies, as it were. I'm using a simple three-part system. It would be easy to divide things up more finely. I'm using terms that are not familiar, but the concepts 
are well understood, the idea that there's a mind, a heart, and a body, for instance. I'm using the word body in all three terms to emphasize that all of them are grounded in this biological organism. The brain has a lot to do with its billions of neurons. The heart has a lot to do with these systems that help us assess our level of safety and bond with other people. And the earth body is, again, about that tangible, solid sense of being a living organism. These categories are a bit arbitrary and they blend into one another in a kaleidoscopic way. So I don't want to imply that I somehow take them very seriously, like there are any rigid divisions between them. They are useful to help us learn to live with our bodies with greater ease, confidence, and wisdom. It's useful as one goes through one's daily life, and in particular as one meditates, to notice where most of one's attention is directed. Is it mostly up in the brain body, up in thoughts, ideas, memories, plans? Is it in the heart body, the sense of wanting or not wanting, liking or disliking, loving or not loving? Or is it in the earth body, the moment by moment experience of having sensations and perceptions? It's worth noting where the attention is aggregated and then making decisions about whether a different distribution might be better in this moment. I want to move forward now, though, and focus on how we relate to certain aspects of bodily experience, certain aspects of lived experience. That is to say, I want to focus on this function I'm calling the heart body, in particular, how it connects us with what we call the mouth, the opening end of the digestive system. And the question I want to begin with is, what is this stuff we put into our mouth? Okay, we call it food, but it comes in many different forms. So here are five. And as you scan the images, one to the next, you may notice an immediate sense of liking or not liking. Some of the foods may make your mouth water. Others may repel you a bit or just be neutral. I'm talking here about that immediate bodily response, not the overlay of knowledge about what's healthy or unhealthy. So it's likely that some of these give a more attractive sense to the body, a sense that this is more wanted by the organism. And that's that immediate heart body assessment, that relationship quality. It's interesting to look at this image. So this is some nice fertile soil. And imagine how would you respond in that relational way if someone put a bowl of this stuff on your dining table and handed you a spoon and asked you to take a bite. How would it feel to be directed in that way? Would you simply get angry? Would you give it a try? Or what if you imagined having some of this stuff in your mouth? Would the reaction be one of repulsion? You know, spitting it out, going and brushing your teeth? You know, it might, because we are accustomed to thinking about dirt as, well, dirty. But there are organisms, our little friend the earthworm in particular, who actually eat dirt. So the earthworm burrows into the soil. We can see it entering a burrow toward the top of the frame here. But as it burrows, it is also eating the soil particles. And they pass through its digestive tract. Energy and raw materials are harvested. And when the waste is ejected out the far end, out the anus, it's enriched so that it provides a better basis for plant growth. And that's why worms are useful in composting. But the point is here for the worm, soil is food. We don't believe that's true of us. But in a certain sense, our food is only one step removed from soil. 
So the vegetables we eat are grown right out of that dirt. So we are eating, in a sense, modified dirt. And even if we eat animal products, let's say dairy products, the animal is eating a plant that grew out of the dirt. These considerations get a little more complicated if we talk about seafood, but the basic points remain the same, that there is something earthy that becomes the substance we call food. So we're familiar with the idea that plants grow upward toward the light, that they use the energy of sunlight to grow out leaves and the rest of their structures, the fruits and so on. That's familiar to us. I think we feel quite at home with it. We're aware, but maybe give less thought to the fact that the plants are equally growing down into the soil. Again, emphasizing this point that the foods we eat are not just, you know, these lovely tomatoes and so on that we slice up and put on our plate. They have a very deep and intimate connection with this dark brown stuff that we call soil. So that when a person eats, as we're watching here, the food that's being eaten is not far removed from the soil, from the earth. So that the process of taking food into the mouth is also a process of taking the earth into the body. And since the body is made out of the food that we take in, we could extend that thought and say that the body is made out of the earth, which of course we already know, but it's worth giving some careful consideration to and perhaps contemplating a bit as we eat, how our relationship to the foods we eat, mediated by this heart-body experience, could be one of relating to nature, relating to the earth, taking in the earth, taking in nature with every bite. Couldn't life feel a bit more meaningful and purposeful if we kept that perspective in view? But moving on, I want to shift our emphasis from that relating quality of the heart body to the analyzing and understanding ability of the brain body and the immediate felt sensory quality of the earth body. And we'll focus, as I said, on the mouth. So here we see a human mouth. It appears to be a young one holding within, the, within its teeth a nice juicy raspberry. Now, I don't know if everybody likes raspberries as much as I do, but they're one of my favorite foods. So when I look at this image of these teeth about ready to bite through the berry, I can almost taste the juices that will be released. I can almost feel the texture of the wet berry as it's softened by my teeth and the chewing process. I can imagine swirling that sweet raspberry syrupy material around in my mouth using my tongue and then sliding it back and swallowing it. That's all very familiar to us, even those of us who may not like raspberries. The idea that we can transform something that we call food into something that we swallow is familiar. And yet in that description that I just gave of the simple act of chewing something and swallowing it, there's a lot of anatomy. So we're looking here at the mouth in cross section. And I want to focus first on the tongue. And we can see how the tongue has a large mass of muscle inside of it. And it's actually divided into segments that can be moved independent of one another. And notice how much volume the tongue occupies in the mouth. When we look in the mirror, we see its top surface and are less aware of how much bulk 
lies underneath. The tongue also has muscles that come from the sides. And collectively, all this musculature allows for rather surprising and nimble movements in the tongue. Some of these are associated with eating, but some are connected to speaking. Some can even be related to romantic intimacy. And there are some that are simply fun. So we can watch people that have trained themselves to do interesting things using their complex tongue musculature. So I cannot perform many of these maneuvers, but evidently it's possible for some people at least to train themselves to take up these more sophisticated activities. Just like a person who plays the violin can do things with her hands that I can't do because I can't play a violin or indeed any musical instrument. So we have latent capacities that can be trained, but each of us is using our tongue in quite nimble ways simply by speaking and swallowing and so on. Now the berry, as I mentioned, is also tasted, right? And the taste comes partly from receptors on the surface of the tongue. And we can see some of these here, these rough spots and bumps diagrammed on the tongue surface. These are the famous taste buds, and they provide information about sweetness and saltiness and sourness and so on. More complex flavor information depends on additional input coming from the scent or olfactory receptors up in the nasal passages. You'll note there's a connection between the mouth and the nasal passages at the back of the throat. And that allows aromas to rise up to where the olfactory receptors are toward the roof of the nasal passages. And so chemicals can be detected and they add to the experience of flavor. I also mentioned how we can chew that berry with our teeth and crush it. The tooth is a sophisticated structure of its own. It's got the very hard enamel surface, the most durable part of a human body, the part that's best preserved in fossil records. It's got an interior with a blood vessel and nerve supply. It's rooted in the bone that itself is a living tissue, a life form. And it's supported by the gums that wrap around the tooth and secure it. Also in view here is the palate. When we swallow and push food toward the back of the mouth, we're able to do that because the palate provides a firm platform for the tongue to guide the food along. Most of the palate is hard because it's got a bone on the inside, but the rear third or so is the so-called soft palate that's also important to swallowing. Notice how the palate is both the roof of the oral cavity, the roof of the mouth, and also the floor of the nasal cavity. And so it's the separator between the channels of breath in the nose and the channels for food in the mouth. And finally, when we're eating the berry or anything else, there's that liquid quality some of it comes from the food, but a lot of it comes from our own bodies, from glandular secretions out of the salivary glands pictured here. They secrete a lubricating liquid and also enzymes that begin the digestive process. All of that together and much more allow us to swallow and enjoy the foods that we eat. There's another way in which food gets into the body. Clearly, we chew it up and swallow it. But when I looked at that raspberry in the initial frame, I began to taste it and feel its juiciness, even though I never actually touched 
the berry itself. By looking and handling and smelling and listening, we internalize aspects of the world. And a simple photograph of a food can cause our mouths to water. We internalize through our senses before, often before, we internalize the food itself. And this, of course, is the basis for food advertising in many cases. But this is another sense in which the earth is digested in our bodies. So as we move through the world, digesting it in all of these ways, we're supporting this experience of the earth body. And as we center ourselves more in that experience, in our daily lives and in our meditations, we feel increasingly stabilized and supported by life. In closing, I want us to have at least a brief experience of meditating into the earth body in a very substantial and earthly way. And we'll use the mouth as our portal. So this meditation will be described briefly, but I encourage you to continue it on your own. Now, when we meditate on the mouth, we may flash upon memories of having dental problems, including tooth extractions or orthodontic work, painful things, expensive procedures, etc. I've had a lot of this myself. So when I meditate on the mouth experience, sometimes these memories and these worries crop up. The suggestion in mindfulness is always simply to notice what arises, to allow it to have a brief say, and then direct attention back to the meditation object, in this case, the rich and fluid sensory experience of the human mouth. And so as we move into the mouth in our direct experience, we could close our eyes, feel the surface of the tongue as it contacts the roof of the mouth. We can swirl the tongue around and feel how it bumps against the rows of teeth and gums on either side and in front. We can feel the moisture, the liquid saliva that coats the tongue and pools beneath it. We can feel the nimble movements of the tongue. We can feel the hardness of the teeth. We can feel the textures of the surface of the tongue or the teeth themselves. We can feel the lips contacting one another in front. And we can build up a direct experience of this cavern of life, this cavern that is wet and full and alive. 